World War II shaped the lives of a generation. The war broke families apart, brought communities together, and turned a depressed economy into an industrial machine. On the home front, citizens sold war bonds and collected scrap metal for the factories. Friends were made and lost as a generation of boys was sent into combat. Penn State Public Broadcasting invited those who lived this history to share their stories of World War II. I'm John Vickers-Jones, and um, I'm from England originally, and I was born in Surrey, England, and we moved to London in 1940, which was a bad time, of course. In ni- late 1940, in September, uh, September the 4th or 5th, uh, they started the Blitz on London, and Blitz was uh, constant bombing, day and night, uh, mostly at night, that went on for six months uh, on London by the German forces and it was a pretty terrifying moment of course with keep getting woken up at night time and having to get down the stairs and run down the street and go to the shelter and for me when I was about three and a half years old as I was then it was quite terrifying and it it came to a point where my mother was sick and tired of waking us up and carrying us and getting us dressed and going down to the shelter. She said, the heck with it, we're going to stay here and take our chances. Which in one way was great fun for me because we lived on the top floor, which is three and a half stories up, and uh, I could look over London and watch all the bombs coming down and the flames burning, and so it was quite exciting. As most children weren't, weren't restricted because... Uh, Their fathers, as mine was, were away from home. My father was in the National Fire Service in the riverboat department. And my mother worked in a munitions factory. I was looked after by aunts who had certainly no control over me. And even at three and a half, four years old, I had the freedom to run around as I wanted. And we had our own little group of kids. We called ourselves the Mudstick Gang, and we still keep in touch even today. We were just like other kids. We played and had our fantasy games and... We used the bomb sites, which is the houses that have been bombed and cleared of main rubble and stuff like that, and we played in those areas. Um, they were our playgrounds. The war for us was not real. We knew it was going on, and we had certain amounts of fear, but uh, it really didn't strike us as this was dangerous. Well, the sirens would go off and warn us that planes were coming over to bomb or to fight, and um, the British force, Air Force planes would go up and they'd have dogfights above us. And uh, we'd watch the vapor trails in the sky and cheer when it looked like the British were winning and boo when it looked like the Axis forces were losing. And we had no fear of the fact that shells would drop in the shells casings from bullets that were being fired up there, and they'd be clattering around all over the place, and we'd rush out and pick them up. Uh, They'd still be hot, and we'd pick them up with our shirts and hold them and keep them as souvenirs. But after a while, a few months of that, it got boring, and we never used to collect them after that. The first bombing incident for me came during the phony war, when there really wasn't much going on. Uh, We lived in a bungalow that my father had built. Um, I was about two, two and a half years old, and it was a Sunday morning, I remember it distinctly, and I was playing in the kitchen when my mother was cooking breakfast, and even now when I smell bacon cooking, I flash back to that Sunday morning. My sister was in the room somewhere, and I can't quite place where she was, and all of a sudden there was a loud bang and a crunch, and the whole house shook. I rushed to my mom screaming, she scooped me up, and my sister and we rushed into the bedroom where my father was having a lay-in because it was a Sunday morning. He was sitting up in bed, and he was covered in a white dust where the plaster had fallen down from the ceiling. And we looked up, and there was a huge hole in the ceiling, and all my mother's best china, blue and white china, had crashed down around him, and there was a large gramophone record player teetering on the edge. And we were staring at my father. He was sitting there like a ghost, covered in all this white dust, and we all burst out laughing because it was so funny. And that was my first experience with a bomb, which had landed uh, across the road in a field, actually. But it was the uh, repercussion from that that was my first experience with a bomb. Bombings were continuous um, in London. We shouldn't really have been there, but my father had come to uh, London 
um, to be a, a fireman. He'd originally applied to go in the army, but, got, but he was uh, not allowed to join up because he was in what they call a restricted trade. He was a glass manufacturer and um, used to make leaded light windows for churches and things like that. And so they called it a restricted trade and he wasn't allowed to join up. And my mother was living in the country away from him and she couldn't stand it. So she decided to move to London to be near him. Later on in the war, there, there wasn't much bombing. But about 1944, they did start the doodlebugs, or V1 rockets as they were called. These were rockets were fired over from uh, the coast of France and flew over. They were pilotless plane bombs. And they would travel over making this weird staccato sound with the engine, which would then cut out. And then you'd count five. You'd hear this drone. And then it would stop. You'd hold your breath and count to five. And then the explosion would occur. I mean, if you could open your eyes, you knew you were safe for another day. But they were quite terrifying experience because you just never knew when they were coming over. But worse than that was the V2s, which was a um, an advanced method of this rocket bomb which would fly straight up in the air about 60 miles and then come straight down without any warning at all all you'd hear was a, a, a sw loud whistling noise and then the explosion and they did an awful lot of damage but they were kind of erratic in where they were fell so you just had chances I guess you either got lucky or you didn't and I guess I was fortunate if we were playing in the streets where the first thing we were taught was you if we couldn't get to a shelter we had to lie down in the gutter. Uh, the sidewalk was raised up and we'd lie down there with our hands over our heads like this. And the idea was that if the blast of the bomb came across, it would fly across the raised part of the gutter and you'd be safe from the blast. What they didn't explain was if the bomb landed that side and the blast was coming this way, it'd probably end up being squished against the uh, sidewalk. <laughs> but, you know, after a while we got used to it. If the bombs were coming down, we'd try and get to a shelter. Uh, you'd hear the crump, crump, crump as it was falling in sticks of bombs coming along. And we'd wait till the all clear went off and we'd get on playing again. It was just a, a way of life with us. All houses had basements or cellars and they would uh, make those into a bomb shelter. They would stock it up with food and water and um, be safe down there. Many times the houses would be bombed and uh, be, a whole house would be flattened. And then the ARPs and the wardens would come along and they'd pull all the rubble away and always look for the basement or cellar because sometimes there'd be people down there. They'd be quite safe for they were in the shelter and um, sometimes they'd be in there for a couple of days. A friend of mine was in there for two, three days, I think it was, and his family were trapped in there. But they had food and water and everything and they dug them out and eventually cleared their area and they were able to get out. So people used to use those uh, as shelters. The government supplied Anderson shelters, and these were curved tin, corrugated iron, and people were encouraged to build these in their backyards. They'd dig a hole and then put this tin over the top and then cover it all with dirt, and that was another form of shelter that, that people had in their own backyards. Yeah. They weren't at first. The government discouraged that, but, uh, but the people ignored it. They, it was a, a safe place. Uh, they went down into the subways, the undergrounds, and slept on the platforms. And they'd be there right until the, all while the tra trains were running. And then when the last train had run, they'd shut off the electric and people would carry their belongings also onto the lines. And they'd be sleeping there. The whole family would be sleeping there until the next morning. Um, it wasn't always safe. There were a couple of instances when uh, a bomb actually went straight through the ground and into the subway station and exploded down there. An awful lot of were killed in the subway. But for the most part, Londoners did use the subways. And the one in Hampstead is the deepest uh, subway uh, in, in London, several hundreds of feet down. And that was a very safe place, of course, for people to sleep. The shelter, you know, it's a strange thing. There was there was two shelters, one which was the other side of the road on the corner of our street and one just round the corner at the bottom of the street. And we were supposed to go to the one that was just round the corner. 
but sometimes said there was not enough time. We were coming down three flights, three floors, and down the flights of stairs, and rushing down there while the siren was going, warning us about the air raid that was coming, and would go into the shelter across the road. And the people there were so snooty. They said, no, you can't come in here, you know. Um, but, of course, we would. We'd stay there. And in these shelters, it was kind of dank and dark and uh, very poorly lit. And all the bunk beds were there. I can still smell it now, the red pine wood and sacking, which is what the beds were made of, the, the bunk beds. And we'd have to stay there all night until you heard the all clear go. And then you'd come out in the morning and look up the street and see the smoke in ruins and you'd count up the houses to see if your house was still standing. Uh, but there'd be gaps in the row houses, kind of like an old man with teeth missing, I guess. it was. Uh, but that way we'd see another empty space and we'd say, well, another good playground there. So kids, we enjoyed it. <laughs> they put up a barrage of guns. They brought all these heavy guns in around London as a circle around London uh, to fire at the planes uh, that were bringing over the bombs to try and deter them and make them swing away from London. Uh, to a certain degree it worked, but the noise was horrendous. These guns going off. There was a gun placement just up the road from us and it was unbelievable the noise that they made firing off these huge guns. Um, there was also barrage balloons, so these are bal large balloons which were on hawser wires which flew over London and that was to prevent low flying aircraft coming in. Many a time I've been standing on top of a bombed out house and see a German plane coming over and wave to the pilot and he would wave back, which is kind of creepy when you think about it now that the enemy was um, uh, flying past us in these small planes which when you look at them by today's standards, they were small planes, fighter planes. We heard all the stories about the Yanks are coming and the song was out there, Yanks are coming over there and all that, but, uh, and they did finally arrive and it was quite something unique to see a total foreign force coming into London and the soldiers uh, milling around in their smart uniforms, which looked somewhat dressier than British Army uniforms. One of the fun things was at the top of our road there was a railway line which ran, carried troops to different parts of England. We didn't know where they were coming from or where they were going to. But we used to stand on the edge of this railway line and look out for these troop trains as we call them. And very often they would be carrying American troops and the, the troops would all be lo leaning out the windows looking at the countryside and we'd shout to them, got any gum chum? And, of course, they'd start throwing gum out the window. And, of course, pretty soon not all of the American soldiers were throwing the candy and gum. And this is the only time we ever saw sweets and candy. Uh, and these strange names, polos and uh, mints and all sorts of stuff. And by the time the train had passed, there strewn up all over the ground were mounds of candy, which we scooped up and traded for other things with other kids. Uh, we never told the kids where we got them from because that was our domain, our area, and the Mudstick Gang was keeping that a great secret, of course. But um, I remember my aunts used to go out with American soldiers. They were nurses. Uh, two of my aunts were nurses, and they, were, they used to date American soldiers. And I remember one guy being brought home and talking about America. It didn't mean a thing to me then being so young, but it, I was fascinated by it, and um, maybe that's one of the reasons why I'm here now because of the fascination of America. Uh, rationing, <laughs> my goodness me, there wasn't much to be had um, as far as foodstuffs are concerned. A small amount of meat, um, a bottle of milk a day was allowed for a family, and a small amount of cheese for a week, and bacon, a very small amount per family per week, and eggs were, were sca very scarce. We had powdered eggs, but a real egg, I hardly ever saw a real egg. And uh, we had ration books, and you had pay for your goods, but you also had to have coupons, and you tore out these coupons, or they marked them off, and everyone had a ration book. And it was, I think it was a good idea, because then everyone would thought they were in the same boat, and they were pulling together. Of course, there was the black market, but isn't there always, and things like that. Uh, but I think we were healthier then too because most of us were growing our own vegetables so we were eating an awful lot of vegetables 
no fats uh, or fatty meats and certainly no cakes or anything like that. Rarely do we have cakes or sugar for that kind of thing. So I think we were very healthy and I think got us through quite a bit because of that too. Certain parts of clo clothing and fabric were, were rationed. You had to have coupons. And, and my mother was in the store and she wanted to buy a coat and the assistant said, yes, you can have a coat. It's going to cost you X number of pounds and I want... 10 coupons, you've got to have 10 coupons. She said, I haven't got 10 coupons. He said, she said, well, well, I want the coat. And he said, no, 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 you know the rule. Clothing, there's 10 coupons. Blankets and sheets, of course, no coupons. And she said, what'd you say? He said, blankets and sheets, no coupons. She said, give me two blankets. And she bought the blankets and went home and made this coat out of the blankets. And she was the pride of the walk, walking up and down town with this wonderful coat that she made out of two blankets and I remember it now it was white and fluffy and she was very proud of it later on it got dyed to a green color and then a red color and um, was actually cut down and I used it as a dressing gown for many years afterwards as a small kid but that was a funny thing you did, you did what you could to get around the rationing you know the, this was part of what it was like living in during the war uh, in London Everybody went berserk. It was wild. Um, singing and dancing in the streets. And uh, I remember my father and my mother and m myself and my sister, we all went down to the area of Westminster because that's where the crowds were congregating, the Houses of Parliament, which is the seat of English uh, uh, Parliament. And it was packed. And the night was coming in. The searchlights, which have been used to light up airplanes of war were now just searching across the sky making uh, the whole place lit up lights were on which I'd never seen before I didn't see lights in storefronts no neon lights or anything like that they just were not allowed and now they were the lights were up fireworks were going off and I remember the king he and his family were actually in a plane which was circling over London and he was broadcasting from that plane and they had loudspeakers on and we could hear him talking and I can remember him now saying, yes, I can see it now, I can see London, it's right below us now, I can see the lights and the reflection of the river, it's absolutely wonderful. And that's all I remember, but it stuck in my mind. It really was an exciting time. Of course, then we had the street parties. Everyone was celebrating and getting food together, which was still on rationing, of course and everyone contributed something to make a huge street party and the street parties were going on all over the London and um, all the cities in England of course so it's quite an exciting time <laughs>